So 2 Kings 5, it, it is a really remarkable chapter and it's one that's captivated my attention now for on and off uh, for a couple of years, three or four years, actually, I think. Um, and it, it's a chapter that focuses on the healing of a leper and the worship of the God of Israel by a Gentile. In fact, just the length and the complexity of the chapter make it stand out amongst the whole of the record of the life of Elisha. And apart from the quite different, different circumstances, say, of Miriam's leprosy back in Numbers 12, this is the only recorded healing of a leper in the whole of the Old Testament. And yet the record clearly goes beyond the miracle of the healing to the spiritual conversion of this gentle, gentile man, Naaman, um, which is a direct consequence of his healing. And the chapter also interweaves, as we've just read, the sad account of Gehazi's wickedness, uh, the prophet's miraculous perception of this wickedness and the curse of Naaman's leprosy, which is then put upon Gehazi. And outside 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman does not appear anywhere else in the whole of the Old Testament. So it is an intriguing chapter and God willing this evening, we'll go as far as we can with the sharing of my studies. I've been told that we, we roughly have an hour. Uh, sometimes you go a little longer. Um, I'm happy to be stopped at any point. Um, I, I doubt we'll finish and exhaust the material I've got, um, but we'll see. So we're going to, uh, I think we're going to have a look at the structure. Um, we're also going to listen to some of the Bible echoes that we're going to find. And the whole point of all of this is as Gentiles of these last days, I'd like us to try and take encouragement from the example of this faithful Gentile of old. So the chapter begins, as we've just read with Brother Rob, in verse one of chapter five, that Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honourable because by him Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. Now, to me, the way in which this is written almost implies that we as the reader should know of this man already, even if we don't know a lot about him. Naaman's a great man. He's a mighty man and he's a warrior. And we're told that it's because by him Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria. Two Kings 5 also wants us to realise that Naaman is a certain type of warrior. He's a mounted warrior, a, ch a chariot captain. And three times in this chapter, God sees it important to refer to Naaman's chariot. We had it in verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. We're told in verse 21 that Naaman saw Gehazi running after him and he lighted down from the chariot. And we're told again in verse 26, um, did my heart not, did not my heart, sorry, went not my heart, said Elisha, with thee, Gehazi, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee. So this chariot warrior Naaman was the king of Syria's right hand man. Because, as we said, verse one, by Naaman, Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria. And so the obvious question is, right from verse one, well, when on earth did this happen? And I think it is important that we understand this deliverance. So I'd like us for a few moments to keep a marker in 2 Kings 5 and pick up some of the immediate context at the end of 1 Kings 20 which will provide a really important frame of reference for 2 Kings 5. So I'm going to go into the record at 1 Kings 20. Um, verse 1 tells us that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were 30 and 2 kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And then in verse 13, we're told... And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel. Remember, the king of Israel has his base in Samaria. This is the northern ten tribes of the land of Israel. And the wicked king Ahab, God sends him a prophet in verse 13. And the prophet says, thus saith Yahweh, hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it 
into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am Yahweh. So God promised to deliver Syria into the hand of Ahab. And by this great deliverance, Ahab would know that God is Yahweh. He would know by experience all that the name of Yahweh represents, his salvation. So 1 Kings 20 verse 19. So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city in the army which followed them. And they slew every man, every one his man. And the Syrians fled and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. So again, God did as he said he would. He delivers Syria into the hand of Ahab's hand a second time. So God has, has warned, warned the king of uh, uh, warned um, Ahab of Ben-Hadad's return. And we find that in, uh, in verse 23, unsurprisingly, it is exactly as uh, God had said it would be. So 1 Kings 20 and verse 23, the servants of the king of Syria said unto, this is to Ben-Hadad, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain. And surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot. And we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice, and did so. Uh, and so we're told that in verse 26, at the return of the year, just as the prophet has said, Ben-Hadad numbers the Syrians and they go up, we're told, to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the description is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, in verse 27, um, that they were all present. Uh, the children of Israel were numbered, that they were all present and went against them. The children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And that's quite a daunting picture that's painted in the mind, isn't it? That God's people of Israel are like just two little flocks. And the multitude of Syrians' army, the odds are incredibly stacked against Israel. Um, only a deliverance by Yahweh could save these two little flocks of kids as it's described, Israel's described there in verse 27. Quite a, a graphic picture that's painted for us. And, and who comes along? Well, it's the man of God. Verse 28, there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, thus saith Yahweh, because the Syrians have said Yahweh is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am Yahweh. There it is again. There it is the second time. We had it in verse 13. Ahab is told really clearly two things, that God is going to deliver Syria. He will deliver Syria into the hand of Ahab. And by it, Ahab was to know Yahweh. And we've got it again here in verse 28. God will deliver all this great multitude. And ye shall know Ahab that I am Yahweh. And just as God promised before, and so he fulfills the second time. Uh, and he would experience this great deliverance. But the chapter, unfortunately, goes on to show that uh, Ben-Hadad again escapes with his life, and he appeals for mercy to Ahab, and he promises Ahab to restore cities to Ahab. And Ahab foolishly makes this covenant with the king of Syria, and, and Ahab allows Ben-Hadad to return home. And because of this, God promises to punish Ahab. And we're told in verse 42, 
that the prophet says, thus saith Yahweh, 1 Kings 20 verse 42, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. So because Ahab had spared Ben-Hadad, God declares that Ahab would lose his life. Because the Syrian people were not utterly destroyed, the Israelites would be slain. In effect, there's going to be a complete reversal of 1 Kings 20 verses 13 and 28. Whereas God had promised to deliver Syria into the hand of Israel, now because of Ahab's foolishness, God would deliver Syria would deliver Israel into the hand of Syria. God would give that deliverance to Syria. Now, we won't spend a lot longer on this. Um, I knew this would take a little while, um, but I hope you're already picking up the seeds that we're going to take forward into 2 Kings 5. But it is important to see the way in which the scriptures record the death of Ahab. 1 Kings 22 and verse 1. We're told that there continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And so in verse 29, uh, of 1 Kings 22. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat, the righteous Jehoshaphat in large part, is charmed for whatever reason. He's flattered and uh, he is uh, joins um, an alliance with Ahab against Syria. And they go together up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, verse 30, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle. But put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the two, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore, he said unto the driver of his chariot, turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. So have you spotted it? Who might that man be that drew his bow at a venture? Who was that Syrian chariot captain who drew his bow, Hebrew, perfectly? And took that perfect God-guided shot. Might this Syrian chariot captain just have been Naaman, by whom, 2 Kings 5 verse 1, Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria in fulfilment of God's word that Ahab would lose his life. For by him... Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria. So I think the carefully worded events of 1 Kings 20 and 22 are the context in which we are to read 2 Kings 5. And I believe that this reversal of deliverance that God now has given to Syria instead of Israel provides the context for the way in which Naaman, instead of Ahab, comes to know Yahweh. So 2 Kings 5 then, the chapter that we are really considering. Now this chapter is divided into three uh, interesting sections. The problem of Naaman's leprosy is miraculously resolved by his cure. 
uh, in verse 14. And that, I think, is the end of the first section, verses 1 to 14. But the story doesn't end there, does it? It is but a brief pause in the narrative before Naaman goes back to Elisha in verse 15. And then we learn of Naaman's spiritual conversion and his confession of faith in Yahweh. And having been both physically and spiritually healed, the record might have ended there for good in 2 Kings 5 and what is it? Verse 29. No, verse uh, 19, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Verse 19, but it doesn't, does it? The record tantalizingly gives you the next bit, a bit of a cliffhanger, doesn't it? So he departed from him a little way. Lovely, isn't it? The way in which these sections uh, are interlinked. And that then sets up the very last section, the third section, um, which is about Gehazi and his efforts to make himself rich at Naaman's expense and the resulting rebuke by Elisha, who causes Gehazi to inherit Naaman's leprosy as a punishment. So, yeah, OK, there's the first section. So I'm suggesting that there are three divisions to 2 Kings chapter 5. We've got uh, the first 14 verses, section A, it focuses on Elisha. Um, the second section then, verses 15 to 19, the main character of the second section is definitely Naaman. And then in the third section, or section C, uh, the last seven uh, verses, 20 to 27, uh, the, the key character of that then is Gehazi. So that, I think, is how the chapter is divided in the inspired record. And I'd like us to uh, think about the way in which each of these sections uh, relates to each other and, and what we can draw out um, from each section. So I want us to uh, consider for a moment the way in which uh, Naaman is paralleled early on in the first couple of verses to uh, the, the, the Israelitish maid, that is the, the maid to Naaman's wife. So just look at this in your Bibles. I've also got it on the screen, but just see what you think of this. Verse one, um, Naaman is clearly named. Verse two, the Israelitish maid isn't named. OK, so that's a contrast. These are all contrasts, I think. Naaman is described as the captain of the host in verse one, whereas clearly in verse two, we're told that the maid is a captive. Uh, we're told that the one is of Syria and the other is of Israel. The one is a great man. OK, and then the other is a little maid. And we're told that the um, uh, that Naaman is with his master in verse one. He's a great man with his master. Um, and those that can speak, the Hebrew can confirm afterwards, perhaps. But lifni, I think the word is, it's, it's in the face of, it's in the presence of his master. And it's uh, the equivalent word that's used of the Israelitish maid. She's in the presence of, she's waited on Naaman's, Naaman's uh, wife. Uh, Lifni again was before in the presence of uh, Lifni uh, is related to the word panim for, for faces um, and of course we're told that by him Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria and yet it's by the faithful mouth of the the uh, the maid that we're told that the prophet um, in Samaria could recover him of his leprosy so it is interesting, I think, the way in which uh, those contrasts uh, are put, the way in which we are uh, sort of encouraged to compare Naaman with the Israelitish maid, the way in which these two things are put side by side for our consideration. And ultimately, it brings us to that last point, doesn't it, that Yahweh had already wrought a deliverance by uh, Naaman for Syria, but actually, he's going to experience an entirely different deliverance altogether. Uh, he's going to meet the prophet in Samaria. He's going to come to know the God of Israel. And he's going to be recovered of a life-limiting condition. OK, so I really am going to stop sharing, even if I've made another mistake. We'll crack on now. Uh, more of a distraction, I think, at most times. Now, to emphasise the power of uh, the maid's words, 
you know, she says, if only, verse three, she says to her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And, and you know, to emphasize the power of those words, the inspired word skips over the transmission of the message from Nehemiah's wife to Nehemiah himself. And in fact, it does not, the record does not repeat it again either when Naaman clearly reports it to the king. Her words, as it were, travel like lightning. In just two verses, the words of the faithful Israelitish maid have reached the most powerful man in Syria. The king is ultimately listening to the words of a captive. And it's also interesting in that vein to notice that whereas the kings of Syria and Israel are absolutely main characters and main players in the end of 1 Kings 20 and 22, here in this chapter, they are playing a very much minor and nameless roles, aren't they? This chapter, you see, is all about Yahweh's power to deliver and to save. And therefore, the key roles played in this chapter Really, the key role is played by Elisha, the prophet of Yahweh, and by Naaman, of course, the one who comes to know Yahweh and his prophet. So the way in which the chapter is described, it's the context that is key, isn't it? The politics of the day are of little relevance to the way in which this inspired record is given. In fact, we don't even know who these kings were, were it not for the preceding chapters. So I've already said, haven't I, that the first section, I believe, is focused on Elisha. Um, And we see that, don't we? Um, We've got it in. uh, We've got it. First of all, he's described as the prophet um, that is in Israel. We've seen that in verse three, the prophet that's in Samaria. Uh, We've got it again in verse eight. Uh, It was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And then again in verse nine, we're told that Naaman comes with his horses and chariot and he stands um, at the door of the house of Elisha. And we're told that Elisha sent a messenger out to him saying, go wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. So time and again in this first section, it is all about Elisha. That's where the record really starts. If only this leper had gone to to the land of Israel, there's a prophet uh, that can help. Um, And and so uh, Elisha, when he hears that the king of Israel is utterly powerless and seemingly hasn't even thought to speak to Elisha, uh, the word of God comes to the king from the mouth of Elisha saying, look, send him to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Almost as if, almost as if Elisha knew of the faithful words of the maid already. I'm not saying any more than that, but do you see the way in which that record picks it up? Verse two, if uh, verse three, if only my Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, Elisha says, send him to me. He shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So proud, mighty Naaman pitches up at uh, the door of Elisha. And uh, we're told that the the message is that he's got to go and wash seven times in the River Jordan. And he's not exactly happy about this, is he? In fact, he's furious. He had such expectations. That great man had expected some great and dramatic display of power worthy of such a mighty man as he, but how very disappointed he was. All he had to do was to wash seven times in Jordan, but he considered this at first, of course, to be beneath him. The great man would have loved some great thing. Did you notice that pairing as well, if you're following up the Hebrew? He's a great man, verse one. He'd expected some great thing, verse 13. There are lots of these little nuggets, these word plays and pairings in this chapter. The great man, verse one, had expected some great thing. I think there is a lesson in this for us, isn't there, brothers and sisters, young people? History shows us that very few of us are ever called by God to do some great thing for him. 
Most of us are never required to show great courage in the face of adversity. Instead, God asks us, most of us, to show our faith in the simplest of ways, but to do so consistently throughout our lives. Brother Luke referred to it really in his prayer. But this is so hard, isn't it? To do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God takes enormous resolve. To suppress the nature that we bear and to humble our proud ways before him in our lives. But Naaman does do what Elisha commanded of him. And he does dip in the River Jordan in verse 14. And we're told he does it seven times and that his flesh comes again to him like the flesh of a little child. But there is a question, isn't there? Why? Why in this very carefully constructed record? Why in this remarkable miracle? Why seven times? I think there is just time for us to have a quick look at Matthew chapter 18, but it is going to have to be the quickest of looks. So let's go put a marker in 2 Kings 5. Let's go to Matthew 18, please. I think this is quite helpful to think about. Matthew chapter 18 um, is certainly the first half of the chapter um, is really all about little ones, about little children. Remember, we're told in 2 Kings 5 that Naaman's flesh has come to him again like that of a little child. And in Matthew chapter 18, uh, the first, certainly the first 14 verses talks a lot about the little ones. We've got it in verse two, little child, verse three, little children, verse four, little child, verse five, little child, verse six, little ones, verse 10, little ones, verse 14, little ones. And I think uh, there are a number of scriptures that feed into Matthew 18. Uh, one particular context is that of the wilderness wanderings, when um, those that were uh, in the in the wilderness that had doubted the faithful report of the two spies they were going to be cut off they were going to die and and they're told in numbers that their little ones them that they said would be a prey them would god bring into the land and it is what that our lord is teaching isn't it we've got to become like that generation in the wilderness uh, that wasn't cut off the ones that are teachable the ones that are going to follow joshua and caleb the ones which will follow the words of the greater than Joshua. So that is a really important context, but that's not why I brought you here. But it's the word little ones. It's the little child that I'm linking to. And then um, we have in Matthew 18 and verse 21, Peter says to his Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Now, I think that is really interesting. So I think there are two links at least between it between two kings five and matthew 18 we've got the little child and now we've got the seven times linked to forgiveness peter says seven times you see i think peter had grasped his lord's teaching you see i think peter had understood that naaman had washed seven times and become like a little child and we might also notice uh, in scripture that Nebuchadnezzar another gentile man of power Nebuchadnezzar the king had experienced seven times in order to humble him and I marvel at Peter's comprehension of this sometimes we mock don't we at, at times or we belittle this humble fisherman but I think here in Matthew 18 isn't a, a case of immaturity. I think it's remarkable appreciation of the principles of God. I think he had connected Naaman to the seven times of washing. I think he had connected the scriptures that spoke of Nebuchadnezzar experiencing seven times. And I think that's what he's suggesting to his Lord, that if we are to become like those little children, then that then is forgiveness required of our brother seven times. And you think about it. Have you ever forgiven somebody seven times for the same thing? That's a lot. You'd get exhausted after the second one, wouldn't we? Certainly the third and fourth. By the seven, have we not pretty much given up? Peter's willing to go seven times. But of course, it's our Lord that says no, that it's 70 times seven, which is, of course, 70 sevens. But then takes us to the 70 weeks prophecy again, uh, in Daniel, again, uh, the prophet Daniel, which links us back to Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? The 77s 
of Daniel 9. And Christ's teaching for us in here in Matthew 18 is that we should not forgive as God forgave individual Gentiles, but to forgive as God is willing to forgive the whole world in the giving of his son, Messiah the Prince, forgiveness which brought, as Daniel 9 says in verse 24, an end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, and brought in everlasting righteousness. So there's the seven times, brothers and sisters. I think it's got a lot to do with forgiveness and salvation. And are those two themes relevant to 2 Kings 5? Well, I think they are. So having dipped seven times in Jordan back in 2 Kings 5 in verse 14, we're told that Naaman is healed. And I'm going to read verse 14. Um, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. A little child. The Hebrew is a young boy. And it is a direct comparison, I think, to verse two. The little maid. The Hebrew there is young maiden. So although in verses sort of one to three, certainly one and two, we put that table up, didn't we? That we skipped through mighty fast, where the record seems to be putting two characters up very early on. You think about Naaman and his list of qualifications and attributes. And then you think about the maid. And we looked, didn't we? Five or six, six, I think it was on that table. And they are mostly contrasts. So very, very different. In so many ways, and yet within 14 verses of this record, the mighty has become humbled. He's become in so many ways already like the young maiden, the faithful young maiden of verse 2. Isn't that wonderful? So humbled and healed, then uh, we begin to move into the second section of 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, he's become like unto this Israelite maid, and the record then paves the way for um, the second part, uh, the conversion of Naaman to the God of Israel. And we read in verse 15, don't we, that he returned to the man of God. He and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, that's Elisha said, as Yahweh liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So the focus on this second section, we've said a number of times now, is definitely on Naaman. He comes back to Elisha. He and all his company. He speaks. He asks Elisha to take a gift. Elisha refuses. Naaman urges. Do you see what now why I say the emphasis is on Naaman? You just read slowly and carefully, which is not what I'm doing this evening. But you read slowly. It is all about Naaman. It's all about Naaman. The first bit was all about the prophet. This is definitely about Naaman. And again, another of these little uh, echoes that come so often in this chapter, verse 15, the language of the Hebrew is very precise. He returned to the man of God. He returned, brothers and sisters, young people, he returned. It's the same expression that we've got at the end of verse 14, that his flesh came again. You see now the way in which section one is going to link into section two. His flesh came again, and now Naaman is going to come again to the prophet. And he's going to receive an altogether different type of healing, an altogether different type of restoration. Humanly speaking, now there was no need, was there, for Naaman to go back. The problem of his leprosy had been resolved. No need to involve the powerless king of Israel. No need to go back to the quirky prophet that hadn't even bothered to come and see him. Naaman could have easily headed home. But no, you see, this healing went far more than skin deep. For him, everything had changed. This prophet had power like no other. This prophet was 
for real, just as the Israelite maid had said. And if this prophet had power, then his God was equally real. None could possibly be equal to the God of Israel. And so Naaman quickly, immediately, completely switches his allegiances as if in a moment. And I want to show you what I mean by that. Twice we saw in 1 Kings 20 that Ahab was told by God that ye shall know that I am Yahweh. But it's Naaman that believes the words of the captive Israelite maid and seeks out the prophet in Israel. His faith is rewarded when Elisha declares in 2 Kings 5 and verse uh, 8 that he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. But now Naaman has come to know more than God's prophet, hasn't he? He's been healed of a terminal illness. He had previously experienced Yahweh's deliverance in a national sense, but now he knows by personal experience God's power to save. And so he declares to Elisha in verse 15, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. And so verse 9, Naaman can, comes and stands before the door of Elisha. Sorry, that is true. Uh, he's come again, isn't he? But it's in verse 9 we're told that he previously stood before uh, the door of Elisha. Did you notice that? Yeah. Naaman stood before the door of Elisha, verse 9. Verse 11, he had expected... Elisha to come and stand before him. But now, verse 15, it is Naaman that is standing again at the door of Elisha. And not just at the door of Elisha, he stood before Elisha himself. Standing, verse 9, standing, verse 11, standing, verse 15. But who's Elisha standing before? Because he's not Naaman. In fact, he's never Naaman. Verse 16, as Yahweh liveth, says Elisha, before whom I stand. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? Elisha couldn't care less about Naaman in worldly terms. Elisha is completely uninterested in his worldly credentials that are given to us in verse 1. He's unimpressed by the great company surrounding Naaman, and he couldn't care less about his flashy chariot that he rode in. And as for Naaman's wealth, well, as far as Elisha was concerned, he could keep the lot. But what's our attitude to these things? What's our attitude to the things of the world? The celebrities, the Instagrammers, the YouTubers, the rich, the powerful, the famous. What do we care? As Yahweh liveth before whom I stand, says Elisha. And now Naaman confesses his faith in God before Elisha. He confesses his faith in the God of Israel. Verse 1, we noted, didn't we, quite carefully, that Naaman was before his master, Lifni, in the face of his master. And in verse 6, the king of Syria describes Naaman as his servant. The king of Syria describes Naaman as my servant. Do you see that? The king of Syria says he's my servant. So Naaman is in the face of his master, a servant to him, just as the little maid is a servant to Naaman's wife. The king of Syria describes Naaman as his servant. But now, now, the Lifni is deployed again, but it's in verse 15. Because they all come and stand, Lifni, before Elisha. That's what I mean by the allegiances switching. He switched to the allegiance of his God. He switched the allegiance of who is his real earthly master. There is a practical sense, of course, in which he has to go back to Syria. And we'll touch on that in a moment. But do you see the way in which the inspired record is very carefully painting the picture for us of just how faithful this man Naaman is? 
So now Naaman knows the God of Israel and he's confessed his faith, faith in him. But in verse 17, Naaman makes a really curious request. Naaman said, shall there not, then I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto Yahweh. Now, I've got so many questions about this verse. How on earth did Naaman know about the acceptable worship of Yahweh? How did he even know Yahweh's name? I've often wondered over the last few years just how much the captive Israelite maid had said to Naaman and to his wife. And I think it's possible that we hugely underestimate all of the things that she may have said. But I have to remind myself that it's not really for us to speculate or to read into God's word more than what he's revealed to us. But what we can do is to note the echoes of what Naaman said here to what we've got in Exodus chapter 20. And again, this is going to be another real whistle stop to us. Uh, Exodus 20 and verse one. This is, of course, the law given to God's people, Israel. God spake all these words, saying, I am Yahweh thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, in your own time, you go back through the early chapters of Exodus and remind yourselves of the way in which the people would come to know Yahweh, to know him in a way that he had not been previously known, Exodus 6 and verse 3, to know him by experience because they would know Yahweh's deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. That's exactly what's being referred to here in Exodus 20 and verse 2. I am Yahweh thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And they're told, aren't they? that they shall have no other gods before him. So now Naaman knows Yahweh. Now I know, said Naaman, that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He knows Yahweh like Israel had known Yahweh. And he also knows that there is no other God in all the earth. Thou shalt have no other gods, says Exodus 20, verse 2. It's exactly what Naaman says, isn't it? Verse 17. From henceforth, thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods. Now look at Exodus 20 and verse 23. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings thy sheep and thine oxen now isn't that remarkable brothers and sisters young people what is it that Naaman had requested he requested two mules burden of earth. Hebrew Adama. Because he does not want to any more offer burnt offerings unto any other God but to the God of Israel. That's exactly what we've got here in Exodus 20, isn't it? An altar of earth. Adama. For what reason? For burnt offerings. How much did Naaman already appreciate of the God of Israel? How did he know? Remarkable, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Absolutely remarkable. Acceptable worship to the God that he had come to know and in the way that Yahweh had instructed so back into 2 Kings 5, so far, so good. But then comes 
I think the hardest part of all to understand in 2 Kings chapter 5, in verse 18, in this thing, says Naaman, 2 Kings 5, 18, in this thing, Yahweh, pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, Yahweh, pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Now, what on earth do we make of this? Why didn't Naaman refuse to bow down in the house of Rimmon? Just like Daniel refused to bow down to the image in Babylon. It is a really challenging question, isn't it? Why? Why does he just not refuse? Now, some have suggested that Elisha does not have the stomach to challenge Naaman. And so he basically dodges the question and offers instead a kind of non-committal go in peace, as if leaving the question to Naaman's own conscience. But I I can't accept that that explanation. We've already seen that Elisha is not at all a respecter of persons. He wasn't at all afraid of Naaman. I think if he'd needed correction, Elisha, the word of God in the mouth of the prophet, would have given it that, I'm sure. So I instead would like to offer a biblical explanation for us to think about. And it does require another transition across to the New Testament, please. Uh, This time, Luke chapter 4. Now, Luke chapter four uh, is the chapter in the Lord's ministry when uh, he makes reference to Naaman. In fact, I think it's the only time uh, he makes reference to Naaman. Um, And Luke uh, Luke four and verse 24. um, uh, He says, um, and this is right at the beginning of his ministry, uh, and he's in Nazareth. Luke 4, verse 16, um, and he's already told them, having read from the book of the law, uh, the book of Isaiah, rather, the scroll of Isaiah, that um, this day, this scripture is being fulfilled in their ears. And and already uh, the people in the synagogue at Nazareth are are on edge. Already they have been challenged by the words of our Lord, God's word made flesh in his son. And uh, he's beginning to reveal already the gospel, isn't he? The way in which he fulfills the principles of scripture. And he says in Luke 4 and verse 24, he says to the people, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Remember, the greatest of all the prophets is our Lord. And he came or was brought up rather in Nazareth. Verse 25, Luke 4 But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, Elisus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, save saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. That was their reaction to our Lord's teaching. Now, why? Why were they so furious? Well, I think these verses give us some interesting points to think about. The first, I think, is that the ministry of our Lord is linked by our Lord to the ministries of the prophets of Elijah and Elisha. The second point is that he's telling the people of God that he is coming in fulfillment of Isaiah 61, but warning them that they are likely to reject him just as the children of Israel rejected God's prophets in the past. And by contrast, therefore, those who listened to the prophets in the past were Gentiles, like the widow of Zarephath. And like Naaman, the Syrian. So from this, our Lord is drawing a really clear parallel, isn't he, between his work 
and those of the prophets of old, and is foretelling the fact that it is likely to be the Gentiles who respond to the word of God, just like Naaman did. And from this, we have to conclude that Naaman is a remarkably faithful character, preserved in God's word as a foreshadowing of all faithful Gentiles who would respond to God like he did. And therefore, we have to read Naaman's actions in 2 Kings 5 in that context. And therefore, that context dismisses any notion that Elisha didn't have the stomach to challenge Naaman because there was no need to challenge him, I suggest. So that is a step towards our understanding, but it certainly doesn't give us all of it, does it? Now, the next part is to show you a chiasm. Uh, so there's the verse in 2 Kings 5, verse 18, um, which is quite tricky to understand. What is he doing in the house of Rimmon? And then if we then show it as a chiasm, it looks a bit like that. You see? So what does this teach us? Well, in this thing, in this thing, what thing? Uh, it's going into the house of Rimmon, isn't it? And clearly he is wanting God to pardon him. He can see that it is at the very least suboptimal. It's a repeated plea. Yahweh, pardon thy servant. And the centre of the chiasm really makes it very clear to us, doesn't it? That the only reason he's ever going into the house of the Roman is because his master leans on his hand. Now, I'm not going to go to it. 2 Kings 7, you compare it uh, to uh, the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. 2 Kings 7 and verse 2. It is an idiomatic expression, I'm that I'm sure, uh, that refers to someone's right hand man. So he is, isn't he? We said, although spiritually he's completely shifted his allegiances, he's described himself as the servant of Elisha. He is now a follower, a faithful follower of the God of Israel. And yet still the, the practicalities of life mean that he has a different master, which he is bound to. So when his master leans on his hand, he is his right hand man. When he is compelled by his master to go into the house of Rimmon, then he goes. You see that? Uh, and, the, and the chiasm there, just around the centre, when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, well, that's only when I will bow down myself in the house of Rimmon. The word for worship is the word for bow down uh, in Hebrew as well. So clearly, the only reason he's ever going into the house of Rimmon at all is when his master goes in. And when his master bows down, then he too is compelled to bow down. So I think that's the second little clue here of how we are to understand this. This is a, a matter of obligation as opposed to any sense of latent feeling for the God of Rimmon. So we see, don't we, an acknowledgement by Naaman that there is something for which he seeks God's pardon, no doubt linking us back to the principles in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, where God has said, Thou shalt make unto thee, not make unto thee any graven image. And in verse 5 of 2 Kings 20, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. That's 2 Kings 20 and verse 5, if you're scribbling notes down, okay? So he can see that it is a problem. But as we've said, secondly, the clear, clear point is that he's only ever going there when his master goes in. When his master goes into worship, Hebrew bow down, then Naaman too will bow down. But Naaman will only bow down and nothing more. He's clearly said already, isn't he, that he will not serve any other God other than the God of Israel from now on. So how does this help us? Well, See what you think of this. I'm going to stop sharing again now. Uh, if you need my slides afterwards, I'll share them through Richard and he can disseminate in due course. The word for, the word for hand is the word yad. And the Hebrew word for know, he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. Now I know that there's a God in Israel. That word for know is yada. So we've got the hand yad. We've got the word for knowing, yada. Now, although not linked etymologically, that is 
they don't share the same uh, root uh, as, as much as it will sound. But these two words, uh, yad and yada, the hand and knowing, come together in scripture uh, like a play on words um, quite a number of times. And I'm going to park this section now uh, and we can perhaps touch on some of it in discussion or, or individually afterwards. But you'll have to take it from me for now that this is true, that time and again in scripture, I've got a number of examples. Um, the ideas of knowing and hand come together. The sense being, I think, uh, more than just a play on words, yad yada, but the sense being to know by doing, to know by experience, to know something because you've done it with your own hands. So Naaman has come to know yada, that there's a prophet in Israel, verse 8, and more than that, he knows yada, verse 15, that there's no God in all the earth but in Israel. And knowing this, he now knows that the idol of Rimmon is nothing, and therefore the house of Rimmon is nothing other than a building of wood and stone. But he's nevertheless compelled, because of his duty to his earthly master, to bow down in the house of Rimmon when his master leans on his hand. But Naaman's hands that were leprous now know by experience Yahweh, the God of Israel, the only true God in heaven and earth, the one that has the power to save. Now, with these things in mind, let's go uh, to another New Testament reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and see if this helps you like I think it's helped me uh, get a handle on what's going on here in, in 2 Kings 5. So I'm going to 1 Kings chapter 8 um, and we'll read uh, the fewest of verses as we can get away with to make the point. Um, but as with all of these things, you make your notes and then spend plenty of time going through it in your own time to be sure uh, of the scriptures uh, and be sure what they're teaching them, teaching us. So Naaman had come to know the God of Israel. What did the Gentile Corinth converts know? Well, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 4. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered unto, in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Where do we get that expression from, brothers and sisters, young people? None other God but one. 2 Kings 5 verse 15. No God in all the earth but in Israel. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8. But though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. You notice that verse five, whether it be in heaven or in earth. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth. Again, another echo, I suggest, back from 2 Kings 5. But one God, verse six. And then verse seven goes on. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. Now, 1 Corinthians 8 is clearly talking about previous idolaters in Corinth. They who now knew as Naaman had known. Those in Corinth had come to know by experience the one God as Naaman had declared his faith in the one God. By this knowledge they knew as Naaman did that the idols are knowledge are nothing, sorry. And this knowledge was strengthening, wasn't it? Those who were strong were able to eat the meat offered to idols. And it appears even to eat it in the idol temple to which the meat had been offered. Uh, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 8 goes on to say, doesn't it? For take heed lest by any means this liberty of your, yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. 
You see, for the one who is strong through their knowledge of the God of heaven and earth, uh, they had liberty, didn't they? Uh, they could themselves as individuals eat the meat offered to idols with a clear conscience, even it would appear in the idol's house, in the temple's house. But the risk was, wasn't it, to those who weren't strong might be led away uh, and uh, in their weakness, therefore, return back to their idolatry. And I wonder, therefore, if that very brief summary of 1 Corinthians 8 helps us better understand Naaman. He understood the principle that he ought not to bow down to idols. He got that loud and clear. To Exodus 20, those links are clear, aren't they? He also clearly seeks God's pardon. He knew that if there was another way, uh, he ought to take it, but but he, he seeks God's forgiveness for it. Um, but of course, he was not bound by the law of Moses. Living as a Gentile convert in a foreign land, the strength of his conviction in the God of Israel for whom he had come to know would mean that he would sacrifice to the God of Israel on the altar of earth. He'd already taken two mules burden of earth for that purpose. Earth taken from the land of Israel that he might worship the God of Israel. And there were no others who would be weak in faith and therefore affected by his going into the house of Rimmon. And when his hand was lent on to play on the idiom in the house of Rimmon, he would reflect on the God of Israel whom he had come to know. There's that interplay, I think, Yad and Yadar coming out in 2 Kings 5, I think. And Elisha's response, of course, to uh, Naaman is back in 2 Kings 5 and verse 19, where Elisha says, go in peace. And uh, we don't have time, but we could go to Acts 10, couldn't we? To the New Testament echo of Naaman in Cornelius. Both of them, of course, soldiers with a good list of credentials. Naaman made clean of his leprosy. Peter was shown not to call unclean that which God had cleansed. You see, Naaman made clean, he wash and be clean. He came, he was clean, uh, verse 14, his flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Peter told, don't call that which God hath cleansed unclean. And uh, Naaman uh, is told to go in peace by Elisha and Cornelius, uh, is told by Peter, about the word of God, which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, for he is Lord of all. So Naaman, go in peace to Cornelius. We learn that God has preached peace, even to the Gentiles, by Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to do justice to the third section, clearly, are we? Um, Which runs from verse 20 through to verse 27. Um, What points can we make in in the few minutes that remain to us? Well, the the failing servant in the land of Israel does stand, doesn't it, in stark contrast to the faithful servant girl living in the land of Syria. You get my point? We've got a a faithless, a, a man that is failing, Gehazi, a servant in Israel, servant to Elisha, And he's such a contrast to the servant girl, the servant maid living in the land of Syria. And whereas Elisha stands before Yahweh, Gehazi runs after the riches of Naaman. Gehazi despises Naaman, who he perceives as being spared by Elisha because he's been allowed to return home with his wealth instead of Naaman the saved of Yahweh, in Gehazi's eyes, he's Naaman the Syrian, spared of Elisha. And you might remember that this scornful phrase of Gehazi, Naaman the Syrian, is uh, what our Lord picked up back in Luke 4, to highlight the way in which those in the synagogue in Nazareth, the Jews of his day, despised the Gentiles, just like Gehazi shows despite for Naaman, Naaman the Syrian. And so Gehazi defrauds Naaman, doesn't he? In verse 24, um, we're told that he takes from the hands of Naaman's servants and hides his ill-gotten gains in the house. 
and how cleverly the inspired word again plays on the ideas of hand and house once again. The faithful man Naaman had his hand lent on to bow down in the house of Rimen, but this unfaithful Gehazi deceitful, deceitfully takes from the hand of Naaman and hides the goods in Elisha's house. So we've got hands and houses twice in this chapter. Another one of those beautiful little pairings that come off, come up so often in 2 Kings 5. And when uh, Elisha confronts Gehazi in verse 26, he echoes the words of 1 Samuel 8, which we also don't have time to, to look at. But remember in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel the prophet warned the people what Saul would be like. He says that, uh, you know, he'll take your your land, your manservants and your maidservants, your vineyards, your olive yards. And that's really what we've got in verse 26, isn't it? When Elisha extrapolates what was in Gehazi's mind. You see, this wasn't just about making a quick buck on the side, giving himself an edge forward in the world. This really, when his heart was to break free of his servitude, I think, to almost be like, if he could, what he longed for, which was to be like a king, to receive money, to receive garments, to receive olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen, and men servants and maid servants. It's almost directly scripted from one Samuel 8. You see, Gehazi desired everything that the world had to offer, including even to the power of the king of Israel. And as a consequence, we're told, aren't we, that Naaman's leprosy is put upon Gehazi. Verse 27, the leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. And this then completes a set of contrasts, doesn't it? in 2 Kings 5, a set of opposites that's been developed through the whole chapter. We had the great man, Naaman, become like a little boy. Verse 1 to verse 14, the proud, humble. The leper becomes a servant to Elisha, but the servant of Elisha becomes the leper. The faithless Syrian, the Gentile, becomes faithful. But we see the faith, faithlessness of Gehazi, don't we? The Israelite. And the faithful maid in Syria stands as a testimony against the faithless Gehazi, who is described as a little boy, verse 20. Again, one of those other Beautiful little pairings. Another one. I, I know I keep saying it, but I, I can't help but spot them once you start finding them. You notice that we said, isn't it, the little maid is literally the little girl in verse two. Well, the servant, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I can tell, the servant in verse, uh, what is it? I've lost it now. It's in verse 20, I think. Um, the servant of Elisha. Uh, he is actually in Hebrew, uh, the little boy of um, the man of God. So uh, we we have the testimony, don't we? We are we are called to also compare the faithful maid with the faithless uh, servant. Uh, and I think also we've got in two Kings five, unless I'm stretching it too far. But I think in Gehazi we have a portrayal of the natural branches of Israel that were broken off because of unbelief. Remember what Romans tells us, doesn't it? Romans uh, 11 in particular. You see, Gehazi is told that the leprosy in verse 27 would cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. To thee and to thy seed forever. Where have we heard that phrase before? Well, it's a shocking contrast, isn't it? to the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 13, that he would give him the land to thee and to thy seed forever. But Gehazi's inheritance then was not the land of promise as styled within this chapter. Although I make no, no comment at all as to, to uh, whether he'll be in the kingdom or not. That, that's not for me to say, and I don't think we can deduce it. Uh, but, but the way in which this very, very carefully constructed chapter, um, which is you know, clearly a defined section 
in the book of the, the kings, which is really the book of the prophets and the kings, isn't it? Even without the chapter divides, it's evident, isn't it? That within the textual continuum, textus continuum that we have, that clearly these 27 verses stand alone as a, as a section. The way in which this section uh, is presented to us in the inspired word, we are to recognise the types and the shadows that are, uh, are here. And, and Gehazi has that as a figure, I think, of, of Israel disinherited, uh, if for a moment, that the natural branch is broken off, the Gentiles grafted in, the big picture cameo drama that's going on through this chapter, which reaches so far forward. And of course, if ever we are to be too hasty in our thinking about Gehazi, but just remember what Romans 11 says, that he can too both break off those branches that are grafted in and, and also, of course, restore the stock because he will not forsake uh, his people for the father's sake. So maybe Gehazi is just a representative of, of the Jews at a moment in time, but uh, we can perhaps think about that more in discussion. But clearly, I think there is the way in which the language is, is so carefully used in 2 Kings 5, to thee and to thy seed forever. We have that contrast, don't we? Gehazi inherits leprosy, the leprosy of sin. Uh, but but uh, Abraham was promised the inheritance of the land. So our time has gone. Um, it would have been nice perhaps to have traced through a few more of these things. There are other echoes which you can go and find in your own time in the New Testament as well, um, particularly to the life of our Lord. Uh, he heals many lepers and he tells them, like Elisha did, to go and be clean. Again, I think just little things like that are, are very fascinating. Um, and we could, you know, follow up more about these little children, the teaching of our Lord to be like little children uh, that comes out through his preaching uh, to be like this character Naaman, the healed Naaman. You know, I, I really can't wait for the kingdom to meet Elisha, to meet Naaman and to meet that faithful captive maid. And I would love to know what happened when Naaman returned to Syria. How might their evenings might have been so very different as they would perhaps marvel together at all that the maid could reveal to Naaman and to Naaman's wife about Yahweh, the God of Israel? And maybe did, you know, did Naaman allow her to go back to her family in Israel? Did he release the captive as he had been released from the bondage of sin? Who knows? Was Naaman able to preach to others in Syria? Perhaps the company that had witnessed this miraculous power of God uh, in Israel. So many questions, the answers for now, which God has not chosen to reveal. But there is, despite that, so much that we can learn from the faithful example of Naaman, isn't it? Like him, we have been washed in the waters of baptism and have been made clean. Like him, we have come to know Yahweh, the God of Israel, to put our trust in him. And we too have joined ourselves to the hope of Israel. So brothers and sisters, young people, let us keep on keeping on. Forget everything that this world has to offer. It is worthless and transient. And let none of us forget that we stand before the living God. And let's allow Ephesians 6 to have the last words. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God. That ye, may be, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Thank you. Mm -hmm.